everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Bits and Bites. Today, we actually, I know I say this again about all of our guests, but this time this is very unique. We actually do have uh, David from Demova, who is part of our Maple program. But today we are bringing him on as a guest on Bits and Bites because his journey to where he is now has been so incredible and we really wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so David, I'll let you take it over. How about you introduce us a little bit about yourself, what you're working on and, you know, um, kind of what got you into coding? Like, where do you want to start? Let's go. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Yin. Thank you to the launch team for inviting me here. Um, it's, it's such an honor. Uh, well, yeah. So, I mean, my name is David, David Cruz. Uh, I'm from Latin America. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm a software engineer. I've, all, I've been coding basically, you know, all my life um since school and i don't know really what what got me into coding was uh when once the iphone was released i was like super excited about tech and you know i was i was just well people were playing soccer on the field i was just like learning how to create an app i really had this idea to create my own company when i was in high school of course it didn't happen um but yeah i mean that's what basically got me into coding steve jobs i think steve jobs the iphone they got got hyped yeah and uh so you mentioned how like you were probably like, one of the only few younger people back then that was like interested in tech and coding and stuff like but i think nowadays the trend has kind of changed where mm. a lot more younger people are starting to see the appeal in the tech industry like what in your opinion or from your experience like what is it that's so fascinating about the tech industry well i think at least at least for me what was really exciting was you could be just eating a pizza and having a computer in front of you. And just if you pulled an all-nighter, uh, you could kind of like create something from, from nowhere, mm -hmm. from food and electricity. So like you could build uh, like a revolutionary thing just, just by coding. Um, and that doesn't happen in a lot of industries. Like if you want to build like a factory, you actually need to build the machines and you need everything it doesn't happen overnight mm -hmm. whereas with software engineer for me it was like i need at that time i thought i need no one's help to build something cool and put it out there for people and you know kind of like having that superpower um makes it so interesting and mm -hmm. even more so now that technology has advanced so much like there's really no limits on when you what you can build just with a computer in front of you you don't even need internet access to build something cool that's that's I think that's what's super novel about about tech. Yeah, being able to create something out of nothing. Exactly. <laughs> and, and anyone is honestly, if you think about it too, like the way I think that you're trying to get the message across too is that like anyone can do this. There's no you know limitations. Um, obviously, you might need to get a computer first, but I mean aside <laughs> from that, like you know anyone is capable of doing that. And so, um, kind of you know, take us on your journey. So like, did you go to school then to officially learn how to become a software engineer? Um, was that like after high school? How did, or were you kind of learning how to code uh, before that? You know, was it through YouTube videos or I'm not sure, you know, what was that accessible for you back then? Well, um, first of all, for me, I think mm -hmm. I have this revolutionary idea that um, for certain like majors, um, college shouldn't be, the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think before I got into, I did study at university, software engineering, uh, mainly because of my family. They just wanted me to study. <laughs> um, but when I got into university, I already knew how to code and I was already building apps. And even like while I was at university, I was the kind of like the student teacher uh, of mobile development, even without uh, going through the curse myself. So um, I don't know, I feel like uh, definitely or online learning was a big thing for me. Uh, I got interviewed by EDX, which is a platform like Coursera, um, kind of like as, as an example of how massive online courses can help people to, to learn. Um, I basically just went through uh, Stanford, uh, you know, open courses. I went through a lot of YouTube tutorials and I kind of like just grabbed information from here and there. Um, I think even Elon Musk once said that, you know, information is, is out there, it's, it's free, it's pretty much free, you just need to take it. 
Um, and with technology, because it moves so fast, I think universities don't move as fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so like whatever you learn today, it will be old in probably two months. Like NFTs, I'm sure they, they don't teach that in school, at least not in my school. Uh, even though they're just, like crypto is just revolutionizing the the internet. So so yeah, online courses and and just learning what's what's out there, what's people doing, what people are doing. That that was the journey for me. I did get my title in so as a software engineer, and that kind of like helped a lot just to kind of like have the title um, to get to the companies that I worked for after that. So in your opinion and obviously you, you talked about your journey. There's, there's three routes that I kind of see people doing right now. One is obviously going to university and getting a software engineering degree. And we're only going to specifically talk about, about, you know, coding and not different realms. Like we're not trying to become a doctor through, through coding, exactly. right, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, then there's the online courses and of course there's, there's tutorials, there's, you can do it for free. There's free ones, there's paid ones. There's all sorts of courses online that you can take. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the concept of boot camps, right? Which is something that we've we've come to kind of know in the last ten years or so, where where it's non credited, but you know they're they're well credited instructors that that are kind of walking you through in, in in a certain period of time, and you're basically getting like the the crash course of a degree's worth of knowledge in say two months, three months for X dollars. Um, what are your kind of thoughts around, like, if someone's, you know, in high school right now, they're, they're in that position, like what, and there's no one, sh one shoe fits all. Right. But mm -hmm. what's the thought process behind, like what route you should take? Well, um, first of all, um, I do think that all options, you know, are good. Like you could do whatever you, you want in your life and the three of them could get you to the same point. Uh, it depends on, um, you know, how much time do you want to invest on learning stuff that you will probably not use. Uh, whereas, you, as you mentioned, um, when you're in a boot camp, they kind of like guide you through, hey, I have this idea, I want to make it a reality, and just teach me finance, teach me coding, teach me, you know, project management. But it's because you're learning stuff that will get you from point A to point B. Whereas when you're studying at a university, it's more like, um, and, and, and even if you're learning online, it's more like, I know nothing or I know something and I, I, I want to learn and then I'll figure out what to do. Um, actually, uh, I, I want a scholarship to go to WWDC, that's Worldwide Developers Conference of Apple. And there was this one guy that I met that he was at a coding academy. And I, I kind of like got struck by the idea. I didn't understood what it was. And he, what he tried to explain was, you know, we have really good engineers and founders that come and teach me how to be an entrepreneur, which in, in, in the software lane, of course. And which uh, I think um, for me would have been a better, better option than, you know, just starting at university. So I think the thought process is A, money, like how much do you want to spend? on education you can either kind of like jolo it and do it for free or you can just pay someone to feel comfortable with the knowledge they can give you and b how much time do you want to invest um big companies like google tesla they don't really require you to have a degree um to work there if you're a hacker you're someone that really knows how to create stuff and you know it they basically just want to know want to have the people that know how to do things um so yeah it depends on how much time are you willing to to invest to to learn something they have technical tests and things like that that kind of gauge your level of knowledge right of course yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. you have to prove them that you know what <laughs> you're claiming you know so they're, and... taking, they're not taking the degree by by assumptions and assuming because you have x piece of paper from ucla that you know a b c d Exactly. Um, so they, my university was not well known in the U.S. And I, I was able to get into both Facebook and Google. And I think they, they, they didn't even know how to pronounce my university. Um, <laughs> and like I was working with people that studied at like MIT, Stanford. And I was like, you know, a, an university in Colombia, which is really good, but no one of you knows. It was more about, hey, this, this is the problem. Can you solve it? If yes, then welcome. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I think in, in past shows and, and probably we, elsewhere on the internet, I've been on the record saying like, I think for a lot of people, university is a, is a waste of money. Mm -hmm. um, not because there's no value, <laughs> but because the value to dollar ratio is, is not there. Um, that being said, like, I think in listening to, to your story, some things that pops out is I think very early on, you were very clear about what you wanted to learn and what you wanted to do vocationally, right. In terms of being a coder, in terms of learning new things. And the, the motivation was there. The initiative was there for you to kind of search for, you know, you know, new, new languages, new tools, new APIs, like you were always playing with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and for a lot of people, they are not necessarily as motivated or as driven that early on. Um, and to, to me, the biggest value of university is it acts as a life buffer while you figure your stuff out. My biggest problem with it is, especially I think in the States, when you're trying to get into these fancy schools, you dig yourself into six digits worth of debt to figure yourself out. Um, and, and I think that like, so I don't want to villainize universities. And I know that we have lots of friends that, that teach at universities and, and do lots of stuff. But like, to me, like, that's the biggest problem right now is, is if you know exactly what you want to do, like, I want to learn C++, I want to learn, you know, machine learning, like going through the six years, like some of the stuff, especially in data scientists, you can't even do that with a bachelor's, you need the, the master's and then et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Um, like that's not the most direct way. Right. But if you're you're not exactly sure and you want to test things and, and stuff like that and you can afford to do so, um, then it might make sense for you. Yeah. You know? And for, for me, another thing that's kind of like intangible with the university experience was um, you know, kind of like a like a fun fun fact. Damova, my company, um first started in university as I was kind of like helping people out to code their own projects. Like we have, uh, like at the at the end of your first engineering year, you would have to present a project. Mo most of the people wanted an app or a website, and I would kind of like code it for them, sell it to them, and they would present it. Um, and you know, I was like building a software development company. So I get my I guess my point is, and the reason why many companies like big tech companies were 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 founded in a dorm in a dorm room was that a uh, university gives you connections university gives you that opportunity to kind of like go out and see what other people are thinking met really smart people maybe met meet pe meet people that are smart uh, meet people that are, you know might kind of like push your business uh, to the next level so i got that at university like i met the right people to get into this software development world before before it was just me watching YouTube videos trying to create an app. And then it was like me charging people and do an actual project. And I, 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 I'm not saying you only get that in university because there's meetups, there's, you know, boot camps, there's other, other places where you can find people, but university is like a safe environment to kind of like network and it's, like people are have their walls down and you can talk to them. It's it's it, it's easier. So I guess that aspect really helped me about university, just meeting the right people. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I feel like that's one very like overarching theme of like the tech industry is that like I think the reason why um companies accelerate so much faster and we're producing um like so many there's so many more like innovations that are coming out, out of this industry is because like founders, the developers, um, just like the operations, like everyone kind of collaborates on these things. Like the way that technology is designed, it encourages collaboration. Everyone's so open-minded. There's so many possibilities of certain directions that projects could go, or there's also lots of problems that, you know, you can't singularly figure out on your own. Like you need, you know, another person's perspective on it. And I think mm -hmm. having all of these different factors like pushed into like an industry like tech, like, I think that's why <laughs> it's one of the fastest growing like industries for sure. Like, and it's really great that you mentioned like, you know, universities, like it's not just about the educational aspect of things. It is also about the community. It is also about the networking. Like I can say for sure that, you know, even though I felt that my years in university were not, you know, the most optimized when it came to the educational aspect, I still have so many great connections and experiences just from the people that, you know, you go to school with and you rub shoulders with and you study with and stuff. You guys go through all the late night 
like all nighters and like studying and then stressing over exams, but it builds that camaraderie. So <laughs> that's Absolutely. what I really, Absolutely. yeah. <laughs> A lot of my co-founders in previous companies and even today, some people that work with us um, at the MOVA, um, mm-hmm. they are from that those people that I met in university. So like you kind of like bring that even even to the, you know, even even to this day, it, mm-hmm. it's something that that's really worth it. Um, and another thing is, I got into entrepreneurship at university because it was easy. You know, I didn't have like a job. I didn't have to to do a lot of grown up stuff. So that's why in university, you know, I founded the MOVA and I founded Vista, which are the basically the two companies that that I have right now. Both of them were born during these university years. Mm-hmm. I find it interesting that you mentioned how um, entre- like being an entrepreneur was kind of like easy because I think one of the main themes that we have from our Bits and Bytes episodes is to talk about entrepreneurship and the different journeys and the different struggles that you go through do you think that you know I think in your particular case like (laughs) I feel that you know entrepreneurship like is like your natural like go-to like that's who you are as a person but do you think like you know everyone is capable of being an entrepreneur do you think or does it do you think that takes like a certain mindset or a skill set or you know do you think anyone can find it within themselves to do be one well uh, I'm I mean I think it's not easy, but like easy for me to embrace this journey because mm-hmm. I love it so much. But I feel um, not 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 a specifically skill set, more like a mindset. I do feel like people that are entrepreneurs um, should just be ready to face a lot of ups and downs. Like there's people that once they they, they go down. Uh, like their whole life goes down with them. Like mm-hmm. uh, they, they, they basically they can't handle failure that well. Um, and entrepreneurship is just a lot of failures. A lot of people saying no. Um, a lot of things just you know software that is not working. People saying you that it's not possible. Um, your competition showing you that they're way ahead of you. Uh, like it's 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 kind of like a letdown every single day, um, but you have that mindset of hey I'm here I want to be I want to be first I want to be the best, um, second to none, um, and you know I'll just give give it all you know well while, while I was in university, uh, my friends would go out and drink you know Friday Saturday and I don't know Sunday, mm-hmm. well I was just staying home coding until three a.m. four a.m. every single night. Um, and they were always like, "Hey, you're not, you know, leave, you're not living your life. You know, you're not having this awesome experience. You're just doing your thing." Um, so, like, you have to give up on a lot of things, and that requires a really strong mindset. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I compare it a lot to just sports and other people that I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just run 4 a.m. every single day. But there's people that have the mindset and, you know, the 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 quality to the quality to to just do that. Uh, I feel like being an entrepreneur, you also need definitely need that. Mm-hmm. And another thing is, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you really really need to learn how to. I don't know how to say this in English that well, but um, kind of like um, put yourself together, like kind of like draw a roadmap for yourself and know where you're going. Kind of like measuring your progress and mm-hmm. making sure you don't walk away from the path that you previously drew. So for example, when you work for a company, these are your goals, you'll get a paycheck at the end of the month. And you know, it's 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 easy to follow the guidelines. Whereas with um, as an entrepreneur, you get so much freedom that you're not really free mm-hmm. uh, because you have to control yourself. You have to make smart decisions. And you know, if you fail, you fail and there's no one else to just help you bounce back. Whereas if you if you take another path, maybe there it's it's easier to just not do the wrong thing. Mm, so that that's also a little bit of a difficult thing that I find while being an entrepreneur, like handling your own money and I don't know, like everything is you, you just need to be so conscious about the decisions you make. 
Yeah, definitely. Like entrepreneurship is definitely a lot of, takes a lot of different experiences for sure. But I mean, it also comes down to, you know, like having resilience, being able to go through those rejections, being able to go through the failures, having the determination, the passion to keep going and uh, the discipline too. Like you said, like, you know, the fact that you couldn't go out on the weekends and join your friends and enjoy life. Like you had all of those qualities to be like, you know what, this is what, these are my goals. I want to achieve that. Like, I know it's not going to be, you know, the best days of my life on some days. Maybe you'll feel really down, but you know, it's awesome that you still kept going and look where you are now. Like, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit more about, um, you know, how you've kind of progressed along here. So actually, let's kind of start with a bit um, going back a bit, because I meant, know you mentioned, you know, working with Facebook and Google um, and how they kind of, you know, working alongside um, other coworkers that, you know, graduated from like MIT, Stanford. So what was your experience like working at such a large, you know, some of the largest and well-known tech giants in the like North America? Like what were some of the like really positive things that you got out of that experience? Um, maybe even if you're okay with it, like sharing some of the more harsher realities of working for such a giant company like that. No, for sure. I mean, uh, I can, I can definitely share you the the thing that uh, I didn't like. Um, but first, uh, working there was honestly a really good experience. My my dream was to go to California, go to the Valley, mm-hmm. work for, for these tech companies. These, these are basically the pinnacle of my career. You know, like anyone that studies software engineering, at least here in South America, and I think the world wants to work for these companies. Mm-hmm. When I got into Facebook, um, which was the first company I worked for, I realized that there's just a lot of smart people in this world, like really smart people. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to meet a lot of folks that they just blew my mind, you know, like even even people that were non, non-technical, you know, like they, they were not software engineers, like designers and project, project managers. I was just, you know, they, they were just incredibly good. So A, learning. You know, it's a huge learning experience. Facebook and Google spent millions of dollars to bring the smartest people and you kind of like have them all just walking around you. Um, that, that, I think that's, that's the best part for me. I, I'm not really into the free food perks and free <laughs> gym perks. And um, I see them more like, I, I did see a lot of people just working more just to stay for dinner, for example. Um, just because they didn't want to cook at home, I don't know. And then mm-hmm. they would work extra hours, even though at least I was a full-time employee, so there was no, no, no deal. You know, I, I didn't have to stay mm, or got any compensation for that. So like this, this whole like picture that you know movies portrayed about Silicon Valley startups and the free food and all of that. For me, it was not that good. I didn't like it that much. <clears throat> I enjoyed it, but you know, it was, it was not as cool as people make it look sometimes. And the difficult part, at least for me, was I really didn't feel comfortable. Uh, I think this happens in every big company. You're just basically a number. Mm-hmm. And either people or the process kind of like shut you down. And when I was an entrepreneur before joining Facebook, because I, I, I got an, an, an interview at Facebook because of one of my startups, <clears throat> they heard the news. There was an interview in New York, so they heard about me and they they kind of like tried to to bring me to Facebook. Mm-hmm. Mm, I guess what I felt was while I was an entrepreneur, I was learning every single day something new. I had to talk to lawyers. I had to mm-hmm. learn about the IRS and the way they do things. I had to learn about law, and you know, just a lot of stuff every single day. Mm-hmm. Whereas in in my company, there was like either Facebook or Google, there was a task, I would complete my task. And at the end of the day, I, I didn't really feel like I was learning. Of course, at, at the beginning, I would learn a lot specific to that company, but then it was just, you know, you sit there and you just code, you just code whatever they give you. And I felt that I got, I felt like that I got to that point very quick in both companies. Like within the year, I already felt like, you know, I'm just, I'm just, doing things over and over the same thing. Um, And that's why I decided, you know what, I want to go back. 
I want to say bye to that engineering salary of Silicon Valley. And I just want to learn. I just want to be happy. I just want to build stuff that matter for people. And the other, the other thing is when a company is so big, you don't really like your heart and your beliefs and what you want to kind of like um, put into that app or that feature or that software, no one, no one cares. So there's not really a part of you in that product. It's more like just code it and whatever they wanted to do with it, that's what it is. Um, and I feel like when there's a company like, you know, for entrepreneurs just listening to this, if you have a company product service or something you, you don't believe in, or you don't feel like it's net positive to the world, honestly, for me, it doesn't make sense. And, um, you know, more for me, it would, it would, it would be difficult for me to make something like that successful. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have that with, with my companies. I didn't feel passionate about what I was working on. Mm -hmm. uh, I did work at Instagram for a really cool team called the anti-bullying team. So we were protecting people out there. Um, and I felt like, like that I was, like I was doing something good, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a monster of an application and just get lost in it with the salary and the perks. So mm -hmm. I kind of like just jumped before I got used to it. I think you brought up some really good points though, you know, like it goes back to the saying that like sometimes for some people work is just getting that paycheck, you know, getting that paycheck, going nine to five, coming back out. But, you know, a lot of people are not satisfied with that. A lot of people want something more. And there is like, I think, you know, there's no wrong answer to this. And I think the, one of the key pillars of being an entrepreneur is that drive to wanting to keep learning more and getting exposed to more. And I do think yeah. that I agree that to a certain extent, when you work at such a large company, like Facebook, Instagram, Google, like you are kind of just a number. You're just like one little cog, I guess, in the working um, machinery of all sorts. <laughs> not saying that you're not important. Like if you took that cog out, like I'm sure that, it, you know, there's going to be some mechanical failures to some extent, Correct. but like, yeah. you know, it doesn't feel as, impactive like you don't have a direct involvement as much as you'd like to do and so actually that's kind of why I do want to talk a little bit more about your other projects that you mentioned because <laughs> I definitely know we talk about Demovo a lot because Demovo was you know the company that you applied to the Maple program with but I do want to actually explore a little bit more about Vista um or yeah that how I pronounced it Vista yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. <perfect. Lisa>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so could you share with our listeners what is Vista and like you know how did that come about and maybe explain like you know how that process went because I know there's a lot of well actually you know what I'll let you tell a story because I feel like <laughs> you yeah so please share with us Dave. yeah yeah um so Vista first of all what is Vista so Vista is an app that helps um blind people around the world what it does is um blind people use the phone with something called voiceover so Hey, a lot of people, first, a lot of people think that blind people can't use a phone, a smartphone, not true. Uh, there's technologies that empower them to do that. Um, so with voiceover, they kind of like just hear what's on a screen. So mm -hmm. once they got it, go into, into Vista, I'm mixing my companies here. Uh, once they go into, into <laughs> Vista, um, the camera shows up and immediately they can just point their phone towards whatever is in front of them. And the first of immediate approximation will tell them like, hey, there's a keyboard, 60% um, sure. And it's uh, using augmented reality technology, the LiDAR sensor on the iPhones and, and even just the polygons on screen. What I, what I do is I tell them how far away that object is. So, hey, th there's a keyboard uh, 30 centimeters away from you. Uh, I'm not with inches. So I don't know how much is that in inches, but 30 centimeters in front of you. And then once they they want to like get the big picture, they can tap on their on their on their phone on the, on the, on the screen, and they'll get kind of like a explanation of there is a man sitting in front of a TV, and they get all of this feedback. It, it they they listen to it like there's a voice like a Siri voice that tells them all of this like hey there's a dog it's a this is the it's a, it's a jerky and it's right next to a blue car. Um, and with Vista, the cool thing was that 
Vista has 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 gone through a lot of stuff. Like I was, it was late December 2017, I think, and Amazon Web Services came out with a technology called um, AWS Recognition, and and I was like, ooh, that's that's really cool tech, but I, I don't really know what it would be useful for. It was a visual recognition software, mm, and at that time I was like going through just, I don't know, like I, I, I was feeling down by my own work. I was working at Damova, creating apps for other people. And I was like, kind of like, um, I was not in love with what I was coding. I was not in love with code. I, I felt like I needed to renew myself and do something that was worth it for people. And this tech came over and then I had this feeling in my life. And then I was just going in like the, transportation system here in Bogota and I was thinking you know there's a lot of people that don't think about you know other people they don't have empathy and I saw just a lot of people just driving their car without waiting you know for the pedestrians to walk or you know stuff like that and then this 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 blind person got into the transportation system and the blue seats which which are the seats um for people with disabilities uh, was taken and no one really cared. And like, I felt like, and we talked about this already, I felt like how can I use this superpower of creating something overnight mm -hmm. to help people, um, you know, with, with tech? Uh, I, I honestly, I think that they are not disabled. They are not disabled, but we disable them by mm -hmm. not creating a world that it's inclusive for all of us. So I wanted to change that with tech. I wanted to basically just build some digital eyes um, to kind of like level up the, the, the field. Um, and that's, I just started coding Vista and it took, it took like one month and I released Vista. It was an overnight success. It was, I got into, you know, press here in Colombia, a newspaper in Russia, a magazine in the US, um, in New York, like live interviews. And it just exploded. So what I did was um, I open sourced the whole project and I let Vista be free worldwide for anyone to use it. So if you're listening to this and you want to copy me and you want to create something even cooler, then just go for it. Just Google Vista and copy my code and do something even more cool. Um, and if you make it, that, that will be my success. That will be our success. Um, and that's that's basically what What's Vista and and it's it's a really cool project. Uh, I wish I had more time to work on it, but having two companies makes it difficult. That's why it's also open source. Hopefully, people people can help in this journey. Wow, <laughs> I think it's a bit of a process because you touched on something so incredibly. Like I I kind of want to go back to um, what you said earlier. How we like, you know, there is not essentially kind of saying that there isn't really such thing as like disabled people or handicapped people, but we disable the world for them. And that, like, uh, that's just an incredible way to look at it because you're right. Like we need to restructure the world in a sense so that it encompasses and involves everyone and technology as a tool for that, like, is just one step that we can do it. And like, it's true, like, I like to try to think too that like those with disabilities and stuff, like they're still human. They're still, you know, they still breathe. They can, you know, they're still walking on the streets just beside us. They still have jobs. They can still have families. They're just like us, but exactly. we try to box them in with all these limitations of how we view the world. But then when you have people like yourselves coming out and being like, hey, let's try to look at the world a little bit differently. Let's like make some innovations that, you know, is more inclusive and we can make the world a much more equal place. And I, I'm sorry, that, <laughs> I want no, to no, no, It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, it also, that, 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 that phrase kind of mm -hmm. like changed the way uh, I do everything, even, even Pineapple, which is my, my other company. It's mm -hmm. basically just like the thesis on which I built upon. I just feel like, um, you know, when you try to show people how the other people, you know, when you try to show a company how other users are using your product and how they 
they can't really use your product and how it affects their, you know, day to day or they, whatever they're trying, their work, whatever they're trying to do, then p companies are like, okay, it's important. You know, like when I was working at Instagram, I, I worked on a accessibility redesign of the Instagram app and I just went through all the app and it was completely unaccessible and we made it accessible, even though it was not my job. I felt like, you know, there's millions of people out there that are blind and are trying to use Instagram. And basically we're just shutting them out of the, of the ecosystem. So basically we're just saying, no, you're not here. You will not be able to kind of like change, interchange social experiences with us. And I felt like that was wrong. Um, but like, you know, that also, if, you, if your company is not accessibility focused or, you don't really want to, you know, make your app accessible. You can also just think about people out there and how can you help. For example, with my other company where Pineapple, Damova created Pineapple. Pineapple is basically just a no-code builder. So if you're not a non-technical founder or you're just a student or someone that wants to create an app and knows nothing about code, uh, you just use Pineapple and you create your, your app. Um, my, my, my thesis apply to pineapple in the sense that I wanted everyone to be able, and I mean everyone, to be able to build an app. Um, my lifetime goal is to, at least not lifetime because I, I hope to complete it really soon, is to get pineapple to be present in public schools, probably in South America, Africa, a lot of places that I know would benefit from that, um, you know, kind of like that exposure to tech, because there's a lot of smart people out there that, that just don't have the means to get into the tech ecosystem, you know, and tech tech is basically their future. It's, it's our future. So if, if you kind of like think about these, we're disabling them by not giving them the tools to be part of this new revolution that is apps, websites, tech, e-commerce, you know, web 3.0, I don't know, whatever, you name it. Um, I just think that we need to give people the tools to be able to be part of this tech revolution. I mean, everyone, because if we leave them behind, then then who's going to be the who's going, who's going to be the people that are getting a lot of techs, big tech salaries? Who's the people that is founding a lot of big tech companies? It's it's not going to be them if if they don't have the the tools to do it. So even if your company is not like accessibility focused. That's the way I implement the a build for everyone. You know, uh, in my case, my company is apps for everyone. You know, democratizing the app app development. But I can see that happening in so many industries, and it just doesn't happen. People don't really care. Um, you know, if your users are US based, then you just you know focus on those users. That's what companies usually do. And I feel like if if we would if we would let, for example, South America grow in, you know, relate, you know, talking about tech, um, they would, they will be your customers soon and they will pay for your product. Then if they, a lot of startups have been coming up from South America because we're getting that exposure. But if, if we keep focusing everything in Silicon Valley, it's just not going to happen, you know? And that's one of the reasons why I left Silicon Valley. Um, there shouldn't be a place in which you get the better, the best connections or the best investors. Uh, I'm moving to Canada and I feel like I should get the exact same experience if I live in British Columbia or in any Northern territory, I should get internet access and I should just get the same connections and we should all, um, it, sh it should be fair for everyone. And it's our job as companies to do that. If you have a product and you can enable testing in different countries, do it. If you can localize your app to different languages, do it. Like it's expensive for us to localize pineapple to more than five languages, but we do it. We took the top five languages and we tried to localize the app. Even if our user base is 1% in those languages, maybe that 1% contains the next contains the next Mark Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. you know? And I enabled that. So just just do it. I mean, just just think about everyone. That's like a little advice I have from my conclusion of of, of Vista. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Like, like, I really like that you brought up the point that, you know, in that 1%, 
It could be the next Mark Zuckerberg. It could be the exactly. next Steve Jobs. It could be the next Elon Musk. Like you never know. But the fact that you're able to globalize and create more opportunities across the world without limitations, you're creating so many like future possibilities, like, and including other countries and helping them develop their technology as well, creates more ideas, generates more smart people. It generates more like networking capabilities. It creates more like, you know, um, <laughs> like it creates more apps. Like it's just, it's just a domino effect, you know, like, and this is just the beginning. And, you know, I love that you brought up, you know, the move to Canada as well and why you left Silicon Valley, because I think that is kind of the key part of why we created the Maple program as well is because, you know, we do know that there's very smart people all over the world right now. And mm -hmm. I know that the opportunities are not really equal right now across the globe. But, you know, North America still has that promise. It does have the resources and the tools and the people right now to help those companies thrive. And hopefully through that, then we can expand even more. And so the other part of it too, of course, is like, we want to bring all the smart people into one room and, you know, have them generate ideas. Like, hey, we have companies from Hong Kong that have these great ideas. We have companies from South America, from Africa. Like it's, it's crazy. Like, and so, you know, really love that you brought up Canada <laughs> and actually that kind of maybe goes into our next question as well you know like um I know that you brought up pineapple and pineapple was one of the um is the app that you applied with the maple program with and um so what is kind of like the future where you see pineapple going um once you have you know successfully come to Canada and you know you got your roots set in like <laughs> where do you think that's gonna go like what are you excited about like <laughs> what does the future look like for you <laughs> Well, um, we definitely want to, you know, just bring pineapple to more and more people out across the globe. There's like 99, approximately 99% people can't code an app right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge amount of people that would benefit from pineapple. We've had, you know, students from the U.S. using this app to compete in a, in a, in a, uh, <laughs> I forgot the name for that, the English name for that, but they're, 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 they're building an app mm -hmm. for the Congress of the U.S. Oh, and okay. Like they have like this event in which students create their own app. And, you know, we have a lot of little things here and there that have enabled people, uh, you know, to use Pineapple. But, you know, what we really want is to get to Canada and make sure we're able to bring these to more and more people uh, across the globe, Canada and A, because it's so close to the US and B, because it's such a multicultural country, give us the opportunity to connect with people from all around the world more easily. Uh, whereas here, at least in Colombia, in South America, it's not that easy to find even people that are outside from Colombia. So, um, you know, we really wanna take advantage of that diversity and make our, our product even more and more strong. Mm, I, I think the other, the other, the other thing that you know, kind of, we look into to the future is we really wanna just not enable people to create apps. We want to enable people to create digital products. Period. So we want them to be able to create websites, to create you know different types of sticker packs, apps, just enabling people to to create digital stuff without being technical technical founders um that's that's another thing we want with pineapple and i think the the, the main reason why at least personally i am moving to canada is um i just fell in love with uh what the con country stands up for uh i lived in the us and I didn't feel like I was being valued as an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Canada is a country very similar to the US. So it's what I want. It's what we want with my wife. And it's why, what we, 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 we dream of as our, as our lifestyle. Um, but with the added plus of, you know, it's not bad to be different here. You know, mm -hmm. it's not bad to want you to, for you to want to bring your parents to this country it's easy when i was in the us it, the lawyers told me it was going to be like nine ten years 
to take my family with me. And I was like, this is nonsense. The nonsense. This is a country that doesn't really care about my family or, mm -hmm. you know, about me. So, I mean, I, I know I, 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 I walked a little bit out of, of, you know, pineapple, but personally, I think that's where we, we look at ourselves in the future, just in the future, just living in, in a country that accepts who we are and gives us that capitalism and that opportunity to thrive and have a North American business. I think that's given. Um, even if you're in Africa, you could build a successful company. I think, you know, there's really no boundaries to that. But, you know, it's cool. It's cool to have um, the U.S. As a, as a partner, as a business partner and have it so close. Um, and I don't know, in the future, honestly, what I, what I would envision about Pineapple ultimately is to how can I open source this thing? How can I give it to people? How can I, how can I make it free? Uh, that's me. And if I get, you know, investments, that's going to be probably more uh, investors on the board. That's probably going to be more difficult, but I do believe that a company should ultimately should, should be for the people. So, um, you know, that's like my, what I see in the future, just having a company that's completely open source, completely free and not having to worry about, about anything, probably just living in a farm in Canada and being self-sufficient, having a bunker. Hey, don't take our farms. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, that's, that's like future David, living on a farm, on a bunker, um, no computers, no tech, um, just video games. And all of my work just completely open source. <laughs> Tech so entrepreneur to and giant. You're trying to live in the metaverse there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like tech genius David Cruz disappears from the planet, <laughs> goes <laughs> underground. He wants to be eclectic. <laughs> so oh yeah, that so that would be the ultimate. Wrapping up, I think I think having these these altruistic girls are are amazing. I think we can all kind of see the the passion that comes through. How do you foresee the economics working for pineapple specifically? Sure, or or because because like at the end of the day, it takes money to to build businesses, right? Like yeah. you you got to feed your family, whoever you guys end up hiring. Those are those are ways that you can contribute to society. If if I'm again still on that on the altruistic train, um, how how do you foresee in in an in internet where where you're giving away most of your value? but you have, you have overhead, you have overhead that, that has, you have to provide for, right. Whether that's yourselves or your, your, your team or something like that. Like, how do you see that working? That's, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the way I see that is first of all, either pineapple or Vista wouldn't exist if they were not econ economically viable. So you have to be smart about what you give and how you give it. Mm, and also the way the way you build things has to be smart um, in order to make sure you can give stuff away. So like, that's something that I learned while working on Pineapple. But I guess the way you do that is you decide where to give and where to kind of like not give or stop giving. Mm, and you just, uh, you, 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 you can make money without being evil. Um, I guess that's that's what I'm trying to say. You can charge users for pineapple, you know, for using pineapple, but then be conscious about different territories have different acquisition costs, acquisition acquisition power, and you could, you know, if I know Colombia, uh, you know, has a harder time paying nine nine dollars ninety nine cents. For example, pineapple is right now it's I think it's less than a dollar per month in in my country. So it's not that you have to give everything for free. It's more that you have to just make sure what you're giving um, is fair. You know, it's fair for both parties. And if you're not, if you're comfortable with the margin you're making and it lets you grow and it lets you make money to pay your employees, um, then probably just don't tar charge three times. At least that's my thought, you know, um, and that's where the don't be evil part comes in. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's able to make money. I mean, I, I'm 100% um, into capitalism, but <laughs> you can just, you can be a good guy. You know, you can be good with people and you, uh, it might be, I don't know. 
I don't know if I'm wired differently, but I do think that being good feels better than having a lot of numbers in the bank. Again, you have to be intelligent and strategic about your business. Um, and there's things you can give away and there's things you, you just can't. So right now, Pineapple is not open source, for example. Um, I mean, I wish it could be, but the smart way to be able to accomplish my goal to maybe someday give it for free to someone is being closed source right now. Uh, whereas with mm -hmm. Vista, it makes absolutely no sense to be closed source because I don't have any engineers working on it. But if it's open source, then I can share it with other engineers that can build it. So it's it's on a case by case scenario. Um, and other 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 thing I I, I you know I kind of like thing you could do is um, just and I, and I already briefly mentioned this is make sure you're smart when you build things because yesterday I was I was listening to um to a YouTube video. Uh, from this guy, Justin, that founded Twitch. And he went through how, when he would build a new startup after founding Twitch, he made sp certain mistakes that lead to the failure of the company. And one of them was just, he knew he had money, so he just spent money. Um, like hiring a lot of people and doing stuff and building processes that are not optimized. So if you wanna be the good guy, give away or save money, then just be smart in the way you build things. Don't, don't. I'm talking from a technical perspective. Don't make sure you optimize your servers. Mm -hmm. Make sure you don't build difficult queries for your software. You know, and if you save money here and there, a, it's going to be easier for your business to be successful, or b, it's going to be easier for you to be the good guy. If your competition spends one dollar per month, five dollars per month per user, whereas you with your smart decisions spend only one buck, then you can give your product for two. And you have like a technology, uh, you, you know, you have an advantage on, on your competition and you're being the good guy. You're, you're making sure people can use your product and they don't have to spend 30 bucks on it per month. Mm, again, it depends on you and how you want to make money. That's just the way I see it. For sure. And so with regards to pineapple, like, I think it's terrific. You got all these kind of long-term goals. What's your, what's your biggest worry? My my me my biggest worry is that technology changes faster than we can kind of like grow and change with it. So I mean apps were not a thing a few years back, and we don't know if apps are going to be a thing uh, a few years from now. And we're building something that basically lets you build technology for today, not for tomorrow. I think that's my biggest worry is how can we make sure we make pineapple this tool that makes lets you create any type of tech that it's useful for the time. Um, that's my biggest, biggest worry is someday apps will die. I mean, they will die. Uh, I think they're just going to become something more in, intangible. Like it's, it, there, it's going to be a little bit more blurred of where you go to your banking system or to your social stuff, everything will be kind of like merged um, mm -hmm. and pineapple wouldn't make sense in that picture. Mm -hmm. So A, that and B, of course, um, I'm always afraid in a good way about competition um, because I feel like that fear entrepreneurs have of not being the best makes you work harder, smarter and faster. So definitely, I, you know, I'm just checking out. I wouldn't call it fear. I'm just, I will just call it like something that wakes me up and I think about it almost every single day. It's competition. Um, not like what they're doing today, more like what are they planning to be in six months? That, that's what I think wakes me up. LeBron needs their Steph Curry. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, Sam. Oh, oh no. 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 I, I was I was just gonna say, um, so so in terms of like immediate next steps for, for pineapple, like we didn't really we didn't really talk about it like officially, even though we've kind of been hinting at it. So like what what kind of people should be interested in pineapple right now? And right how now can they find access to this. 
Okay, so right now we, our users uh, are mainly non-technical founders trying to build a prototype for their app or a first version of their app that they can show and validate the product with. Um, we have uh, schools, students, educational organizations that want to teach uh, people how to create apps or they want to get their students kind of like an intro to this whole world that is app development. And um, I would say that people with development agencies get ready because we're working a lot on a lot of features to let agencies and even software engineers or technical people build apps that are more powerful and more useful. And you can stay tuned or download the app at just by going to pineapple.build and you know here's something that we haven't shared in our social media or anywhere this is kind of like psh, news um editor put the news thing i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> uh we're we're releasing pineapple on web so we are releasing pineapple web we're already in closed beta beta testing uh, we have a couple of organizations working on it it will make it easier for agencies to create apps um so, you know, just go pineapple.build, create an account, download the app, and um, be ready for, for what's coming. Cool. Hey, amazing. So, um, that was a lot of information. Um, definitely going to include, make sure to include uh, what David mentioned with uh, news on the closed beta that's going to be coming out. And then we'll definitely have links to the Pineapple app as well as Vista. Um, but David, is if there is anyone that's listening right now that wants to get in touch with you just to pick your brain or anything like that, ooh. <laughs> 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 can we leave you, you know, like, is there LinkedIn or like, you know, Pineapple social medias or what's the best way maybe if they want to get in touch, how can they reach you? Yeah, so all of my um, social networks are uh, David Cruz CS. Um, so you can find me on Instagram, on you know whatever you want, Twitter, and it would be it will be the same username, or you can just Google my name on LinkedIn and it will probably show up. Um, so yeah, just um, you can look for me as David Cruz CS. All right, you heard it here, folks. All right. Also, before we wrap up, we do have one bonus question that we ask all of our guests. <laughs> putting you on the spot here a bit. So um, I know usually this takes a little preparation, but this is kind of an oversight of my part. I forgot to drop that question for you. So okay. <laughs> you might need a couple of seconds to think on this, but if you were able to create a dream team of, let's make it, you know, two or three people just to, you know, give you some options here. Uh, let's say you're building a new project. You can mm -hmm. bring on any one of your choice, they could be, you know, cartoon characters, they can be celebrities, you know, they could be, you know, dead scientists or maybe dead presidents in the past, family members, whoever you want it to be, who would those two, three people be? And then if you have reasons to explain why. Okay. So first, uh, oof, I don't know. I don't want to sound cliche. Um, I get two seconds to think about it. Okay, so <laughs> of course one of the one of the people that I really admire, and you know even my wife drew an oil hand painted pro portrait of this person because it was so influential to me uh, was Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not because of Apple, but because of just the way he thought about the world around us. Maybe he was not the best technical, he's not the best technical partner, but definitely Steve Jobs, he would be part of the team. Um, I guess we need a crazy one. You know, we need someone that's Steve crazy Jobs wasn't enough. the crazy one? No, Steve Jobs, <laughs> Steve Jobs was definitely not, not the crazy one. Um, I think the crazy one, even though I, I used to like the guy right now, I don't know. I still like the guy. Just don't follow him on Twitter. Uh, would be <laughs> Elon Musk. Yeah. I think it's... you do need that someone that would jump off the cliff mm, with you. He would be that guy. And I guess the third person would be difficult one. Ooh. 
I don't know. I think the third person would probably we, if we could work together, uh, Mapal. Uh, she's an artist and she's my wife and she she's so supportive. And whenever I try to fall, she's always there to pick me up. So I feel like having that is really important for an entrepreneur. So like, you know, you have to have someone to jump with, but you have some, you need someone to heal you up. And that, that would be her. So that would be my team. So she's not the crazy one either. <laughs> no, she's not the crazy one. <laughs> I would be the, I would be the technical one. That's that. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. That, that, that would be the team. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to think about it before. <laughs> no, those are really great answers. I once you said, you know, when you dropped the line about don't follow his Twitter, I'm like, oh, I hear Elon Musk coming in. <laughs> yeah, and I love that you include Mapa and Maria um, as well, because you know it's true. Like behind every successful person, there's equal partner behind them that's helping you know pull each other up and working together behind the scenes as well and yep yep, yep. everyone <laughs> needs that so <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much David for joining us on this oh, episode today it's yeah no I loved all the responses and quite a lot to like digest but I think of the listeners that will be viewing this episode or hearing in like I think you'll definitely inspire quite a number of people. Like I, like I said, every time I talk with you, I feel like a little bit more inspired every day. <laughs> oh, thank so, you so much. Shane. Yeah, no, I really love having you part of our program and also joining us on the show today. So appreciate it. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Jean. Thank you, yeah. Sam. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone. So um, hopefully you guys are listening in. Our next episode is going to be a special one. We are bringing in the launch staff once again for our end of year Christmas episode. Um, so we will be hopefully doing some challenges in person, thankfully. Um, and it will be more of a crazier episode. So we'll see you there. And yeah, take care, everyone. Have a great evening or day. And we'll see you at the next one. Bye.